A few weeks ago, I took three days off and went to visit my friends in Ohio, Willis and Kathy. I hadn't seen them in um, a year and a half. And the many years that we've been friends, that's the longest we've ever gone. And many of you are, have experienced those same um, things of wanting to be with people over the past year and just not being able to. And um, it was so good to be together again. And there's a new baby and things have changed and it was just so good. Willis and Kathy are um, Amish and they're also farmers and they used to dairy farm. Um, until just a couple of years ago where, um, but industrial agriculture um, put so much pressure on them and other farmers in the area that they stopped dairying and started sheep farming. We're all about the same age and we were having some great conversation over supper one evening about what our futures are and kind of dreams and hopes that we have. And they started to dream out loud about a cottage, a dotty house, they call it. It's an Amish tradition to build a small little house to retire in on the farm. And Kathy had picked out a, a spot on a hill, that part of Ohio, you can call it a hill, um, a rise and it overlooks the farm. So after dinner, um, Willis and I walked out to see this spot, walked through the pastures and walked up the hill and the, um, it had rained a little earlier and there was um, there were still clouds in the sky and the sun had just set. So there was this fiery orange red glow in the west. It was quite beautiful and the sheep were grazing below us, a few hundred sheep. And um, some of my old sheep were in that flock and I called them and they responded. It's kind of fun, biblical even. <laughs> and we were enjoying the scene, like it's just beautiful pastoral scene. And I was so excited that they were even thinking about this. And I was saying that what a great location it is. And Willis said, yeah, you know, it's, it would be a lot of fun and it's good. Um, but there's something about the house. He said, there's something about the house. I've lived there my entire life. He was born in that house. On our, this, it was getting dark and we made our way down the hill and back through the pastures. And I asked him, I said, what does it feel like to farm the same land that your parents farmed and your grandparents farmed before them? He said, you know, it's a really good feeling. He said, one that I'm just coming to appreciate more and more. And this was telling, he said, and there's more to feel about that. We just let that sit. There was no need to say any more about it. I knew what he was talking about. There are enormous pressures from the larger economy, making it untenable for small farmers. He was asking a question, how much longer can we farm here? What kinds of decisions would his children make about their vocation in light of that? What he was really asking is how much longer Will this place be home? For Willis and Kathy, home is rooted in a piece of land with all of the creatures and all of the plants, with all of the wildlife, all a place that they have known for so many years, but also in the relationships that grow out of that land, the community that they are a part of, the community that they are embedded in. That's one experience of home. Contrast that with mine, which is on the other end of the spectrum from that. My father died in a car accident when I was less than a year old. And um, right after that, my mother built a house, a small little house on the corner of her parents' dairy farm in Thurmont, Maryland, in rural Maryland. And so my earliest memories were on that farm. That, that's where my childhood was spent. Um, I just, every year, it always catches me. I smell honeysuckle and I'm suddenly a five-year-old boy fishing in a farm pond somewhere. But around about the time I was six or so, um, my grandfather, who was the farmer there, he died. And my grandmother didn't want to farm. That was not her thing. And so she sold the herd, she sold the farm and moved to California. 
Well, less than a year later or so, my mom, sister, and I moved to California. I literally woke up one morning on a dairy farm in rural Maryland and went to sleep that night in Los Angeles. And I have been trying to get back home ever since. For some people, home is a place. For some of us, it's a dream. For some of us, it's something that we want to undo. Some of us, it's something we want to redo. Whether we're running from it or running towards it, whether we hope for it or remember it, there is within many of us, if not all of us, this longing to be at home, to have a home, to be in a place where we are known, where we are loved but also a place that we know, not just are acquainted with, but deeply know, where we know the creatures, we know the plants, we know the way where the sun rises and where it sets on the solstice. We want to be connected in really meaningful ways with the world, the earth around us, and also with one another. In this passage from 2 Corinthians, that Jody read for us, Paul describes this tension that we feel. He writes in verse 1, which we didn't hear, but we have to pick up there. Paul writes, For we know that if the earthly dwelling we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What he's doing is he's playing on this tension. He's playing on this tension between our earthly home and this longing that we have for transcendence that it's going to be something greater. He picks it up in verse eight and describes the longing. Yes, we do have confidence and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, when you first hear that, you think, oh, well, Paul's saying, boom, hit the eject button and get out of here because our home is not really on this earth. It is in heaven. But Paul's not doing that. He's not advocating that. He's not proposing some kind of spirituality of escapism. What Paul's doing is he's putting his finger on a universal human experience. We want more from this life. We want our lives and the places we live to be infused with meaning and significance. The tension, the thing that Paul names that troubles us is so often we don't feel that way. That tension, that longing, that desire for something more than we have here, Paul says, is a longing for a spiritual home to be deeply rooted spiritual. I love the way Raymond Carver captures this in his poem, Late Fragment. He writes, And did you get what you wanted from this life even so? I did. And what did you want? to call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. That's the longing. That's what we feel. That's what St. Paul describes. Our longing for home is an ancient one. It goes all the way back into the earliest of human literature. Think about Odysseus trying to find his way back home. It's an old, old longing, but industrial capitalism has made us less at home, less connected, less rooted than any of our ancient ancestors ever thought of. Our political economy has severed our connection with the earth and with one another. In the past few hundred years, as this industrial economy has grown, it has disconnected us from the earth it has disconnected us from one another, but our religious beliefs have changed and do the same thing. After the first and second great awakenings, American Christianity changed its focus to emphasize life in heaven as our real life, that heaven was going to be the place where we really experienced intimacy with God, that that was, that was our goal to get people there rather than living well here rather than living lives of connection and wholeness and wellness here in this earth. And they use this passage from St. Paul to um, support that kind of escapism. But think about Jesus. We gotta go back to that source. 
You know, Jesus talked about that there was more to this world than meets the eye. That there is some kind of depth, some kind of experience of this cosmos that we can't quite see. But for him, it was not out there in some distant future. It was not in some uh, place like heaven. For him, this greater reality that in he, the words he used for it were the kingdom of God. For him, this greater reality was right here, right now. It's all around us, he said. He said, it is so close, you can reach out and grasp it. It is at hand. And he said, it is within you. When I was a little boy, if you can indulge yet another little boy story, <laughs> I went to an amusement park. Don't know, don't remember which one, it's all a little fuzzy. But early on in that visit, I was given a helium balloon. I don't know how I got it, um, but that was a huge mistake. I got it early and I was determined that this helium balloon was going to be tied to my bed that night. So I was watching it, I was distracted, I was stumbling around, I was wandering off because I was wanting to look at this balloon and make sure that I had held on to it. I passed up going on some rides because I didn't want to let go of the balloon. When I did get somebody to hold the balloon and go somewhere, I was looking back because I didn't really trust them to hold on to that balloon. You can totally see where this is going, right? At the end of the visit, just towards the end, we're getting ready to leave. I reached into my little bag there for a piece of candy and whoo, there it went. And I just looked up in the sky and cried. <laughs> but the truth that I did was unable to see as a child was so long as I was holding on to that string, looking up at all of that, balloon. I was missing all the fun in the amusement park. I was not present to what was there. If we think that the ultimate spiritual reality is in the future, in heaven, we have got to let that balloon go. If we think that the earth doesn't matter in compared, comparison with heaven, we've got to let that balloon go. Because those things are keeping us from fully living life here and now. It is time. It is time for us as a church to reimagine the Christian vocation. To move from holding out salvation in the next world to living deeply in this one. It is time for us to reclaim our creatureliness. It's time to reclaim the resurrection, not as a catapult that launches us into the next life, but a process of living here now with one another. I wish I could map out for you the coordinates to find your way back home. I wish I could tell you how it is that you might find that home you're looking for. The thing about it is, it just doesn't follow a formula like that. It's not something that we can just vaunt our will against and make it happen. But what I do know from the scriptures, what I do know from our tradition, what I do know from my own life, is that the one thing that we can do, and maybe the only thing that we can do, is dig in where we are. Wherever you find yourself, Build meaningful relationships, heartfelt relationships with the earth and all of its creatures. Build meaningful, heartfelt relationships with the people in your life. And when we do that for as long as we can do it, every once in a while, grace will come in and put all of it together and give us a sense that there is something greater. That grace will work in us, and from one moment to the next, we will feel like we've finally come home.